I'm convinced that what most people are hungry for is spiritual and moral leadership. In our globalised and technologically savvy world, we're learning again that it's only this kind of leadership that can provide us with the compass we need to chart the choppy waters of contemporary life. As each day we wake up to yet more news of mismanagement and corruption at local, national and international levels, we recognise again that economic and political power that's devoid of spiritual leadership leaves us all adrift. That's why I've spent the first few videos in this series of 95 looking at the Bible. As I've said before, it's constantly inspired me. But even as our society searches for new direction and inspiration, they struggle to look to the Bible. I think our dilemma is best summed up by a friend of mine who, struggling with various life issues, told me bluntly, my problems are deep enough already. Why on earth would I want to join the church? All that added condemnation and narrow-mindedness from that bunch of Bible-bashing God-botherers. It's more than I can cope with right now. This is why I believe it's the responsibility of those of us who still believe the Bible is relevant and central to all of the issues that our contemporary society faces to start reading it more intelligently than we have done so far. I say again, only this will give us the raw material we need to deal with the array of contemporary moral and spiritual issues facing society today, all the resources which the generations beyond us will need as they confront what it means to follow Jesus in the future. So here's my latest principle for reading the Bible well. The Bible does not provide the final answer to every moral issue. It is not the finished or finalised word of God. We have to listen to God ongoingly. Take, for example, the pressing issue of modern-day slavery. It's estimated that there are at least 45 million people in slavery around the world right now and that about 10 million of these are children. Girls forced to marry older men. Children and women who are forced into prostitution. Men, women and children forced to work in agriculture, domestic work and factories. They're coerced, threatened, imprisoned, mentally, physically and financially abused, controlled, exploited, dehumanised, bought and sold as property. Here's the thing. We believe that slavery is a blight on humanity. We believe that all people have the right to live and thrive in freedom. But this, unfortunately, is not the view of the Bible. And when we, with no explanation, casually tell people that the Bible is the good book, they find our attitude therefore shocking. The Old Testament not only endorses slave keeping and trading, in Leviticus it also offers a quick and easy guide to terms and conditions around its practice. I quote, your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clans born into your country and they will become your property. You can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life. It's an international trafficker's charter. But understandably, the New Testament has moved on. The Bronze Age morality of Leviticus has given way to new kinds of thinking, although some of its writing is still heavily influenced by the brutality of Roman culture. So the Apostle Paul, the writer or inspirer of 13 of the New Testament's 27 books, proposes more humane forms of slave keeping. 
He no longer supports slave trading, which in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 is roundly condemned. And then in a letter to his friends in the city of Colossae, chapter 4, he orders slave traders to provide their slaves with what is right and fair, although this falls full short of setting them free. Equally, Paul is keen to make the point that slaves are to obey their masters in everything, Colossians chapter 3, a view that he also makes to his friends in Ephesus. In other words, the New Testament fails to deliver the clear-cut condemnation of slavery that each and every one of us would regard as a fundamental human right. Instead, it endorses a practice that we find anathema. Why? Now, it's worth mentioning at this point that although it's sometimes argued that because in Galatians, Paul explains, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, nor male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, his writing does teach an end to slavery. But this is to read something in that's not there. This passage is no more a call for the abolition of slavery than it is for the obliteration of gender of male and female. We're one, but we're different, it's saying. More than this, all the scholars agree that Galatians is one of Paul's earliest letters, which means that it was written before his statements and subsequent remarks about keeping slavery in place. But in spite of all this, centuries later, abolitionists, including in the UK, both William Wilberforce and Orlando Equiano, the African writer who'd been kidnapped and sold as a child slave and then indoctrinated to believe that the Bible taught that he should obey his slave masters, on being set free, began to campaign for abolition. Both were committed followers of Christ who came to a view that slavery, all slavery, everywhere was wrong. They took this stance even though all of the Bible's proof texts were on the side of the slave owners, as the slave owners kept pointing out, and that not one text existed to support their abolitionist campaign or give them the mandate for their work, which was to end slavery in their generation. So rather than basing their approach on the wording of isolated verses and texts or trying to bend other verses back to their view, they decided to build their stance around what they understood to be the deeper resonance and the direction of travel of the whole biblical narrative. They believed that the life and the example of Jesus should be the compass for their recalibration that his inclusion of women and other socially unacceptable groups of his day, which challenged the social norms and the perceived orthodoxy of those around him, provided them with the principles that they could reapply to the issues, like slavery, that the New Testament was silent on, but through which the Spirit of God would guide them across the unknown and uncharted waters ahead of them. I do not believe that the Bible provides the final answer to a whole number of moral issues which society has subsequently wrestled with. For instance, historically, civil rights, divorce, or women in leadership, still a problem in some places today, or with issues we wrestle with today. For instance, contraception, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and gender issues all those with which the church will have to wrestle with in the future. But I do believe that it's our task to accept the challenge that each new ethical issue that confronts us is seen through the lens of Jesus, who even the Bible acknowledges is the Word of God, and to project his values and approach into the constantly changing and evolving world in which we live and work as we face the challenge of the new and often complex contemporary ethical issues which never even arose what or were imagined in the cultures of the biblical writers. And I call this trajectory or projection hermeneutics. You can scour the Bible from end to end and it will offer no direct guidance on gender reassignment, tax and property law in a capitalist society, same-sex marriage, 
or interfaith relationships in a globalized world. Only the life and teaching of Jesus, building on the beauty of the latter-day prophets of the Old Testament who taught Israel that what God really required was not obedience to the draconian laws of Leviticus and other early books, but rather simply that they act justly, they loved mercy, and they walked humbly with their God. I recognise that my critics really worry that my approach undermines the authority of the Bible, but my point is simply this. The authority of the Bible has already been undermined by the church's refusal to deal more realistically with the text of the Bible for what it is. Now we have to rebuild its authority. In growing numbers, successive generations, first the baby boomers, then Generation X, then the millennials, and now what is sometimes called the Linkster generation or Generation Z, those born since the turn of the millennium, grow steadily, generation by generation, ever more disillusioned with the institution of the church and our failure to present the Bible as having anything sensible to say to the moral issues our society faces. But the principle is this, God is not behind us back in the past. He's not endlessly trying to draw us back there to where we used to be. Instead, God is ahead of us. He's pulling us forwards towards a better and more inspiring vision for our future role in societal leadership than we might at this moment be able to imagine. What do you make of this? What do you think?